It's a great pleasure for me uh, to introduce uh, our event this evening, the uh, Christy and Tony DeNicola Family Colloquy, which is an inaugural event here at the Center for Ethics and Culture, where we have two extraordinary minds uh, engaging in charitable, spirited dialogue about a, a compelling subject. And for me in particular, it's a great treat because Michael Sandel and Robbie George, uh, I had the great privilege of working with both of these gentlemen uh, at the President's Council on Bioethics uh, under Leon Cass. Michael Sandel is the Ann T. and Robert M. Bass Professor of Government at Harvard University, uh, where he's taught since, uh, he taught pol political philosophy since 1980. Uh, he has a, a wide array of uh, important publications. Uh, obviously, his, his, uh, his, his work, Liberalism and the Limits of Justice, is an extraordinary, uh, extraordinarily weighty piece. Uh, tonight, we're going to be discussing his most recent offering, What Money Can't Buy, The Moral Limits of Markets. This will, make a, this will be the foundation for our conversation this evening. Um, uh, he teaches uh, the most widely subscribed course at Harvard University, the course on justice, which is enrolled over its, uh, in person over 15,000 students, but it's impossible to say with any certainty how many students have actually taken the course online. It's now available online and, of course, was the subject of a, uh, a PBS series. Uh, Michael has guest lectured at the Sorbonne and uh, delivered the Tanner Lectures of, uh, on Human Values at Oxford University, as well as the BBC Rife Lectures. Uh, in China Newsweek in 2010, named Michael the most influential foreign figure of the year uh, in China. Uh, and as I mentioned before, he uh, served on the President's Council on Bioethics, and it's a wonderful privilege for me to introduce Michael here this evening. So let's, let's welcome Michael. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> to my left uh, is Robert George uh, of Princeton University, where he is the McCormick Professor of Jurisprudence, the chair that Woodrow Wilson held, I believe, uh, at, at Princeton University. Don't he, blame me. <laughs> he directs the James Madison Program in American Ideals and institutions. He has served on multiple governmental commissions, including on the President's Council on Bioethics. Most recently, uh, he was pressed into service on the United States Commission on International Religious Freedom. Uh, he's com uh, completed a term uh, as an active member of UNESCO's World Commission on the Ethics of Scientific Knowledge and Technology. Um, he, uh, he's the author of numerous influential texts, including, of course, Making Men Moral, Civil Liberties and Public Morality, and In Defense of Natural Law. And most recently, what, uh, along with his co-authors, Sharif Gurgis and Ryan Anderson, What is Marriage, which will be uh, available very shortly. Um, so it is, again, a great privilege of mine to introduce my, my, my friend and colleague, uh, Professor Robert George. Pardon? <laughs> now, at the Center for Ethics and Culture, we pursue, again, uh, uh, spirited collegial engagement with, with, uh, with uh, intellectuals and scholars at the very highest level. And this, this colloquy is meant to, to model precisely that principle that we, we pursue uh, at, at the center. And so it's gonna, it might be something a little different from what you're used to. Essentially, this is going to be a real, a real conversation uh, between two uh, wonderful, public-spirited, and thoughtful gentlemen uh, on a topic of, of major import. Again, Michael's book uh, on the question of, uh, of free markets and commodification. So essentially, my role here is simply to introduce the, the speakers uh, and then get out of the way so that you all can enjoy uh, the fruits of this, of this engagement. So we'll begin uh, with, with Robbie. Well, good. Thank you very much, uh, Carter. It's a great, great pleasure to be uh, back at Notre Dame. I always have a feeling of coming home uh, when I come to Notre Dame. And I am feeling especially uh, happy about Notre Dame uh, these days because of the uh, wonderful decision to uh, appoint Carter Sneed as uh, David Solomon's successor in the Center for Ethics and Culture. And I want to salute David Solomon for everything he did to build this center into such a wonderful institution. David, too. David, where are you? Please. Please. There he is. And the center, and Notre Dame University, have a vocation, a mission, to think hard about the most important moral and spiritual questions. And that's why it's such a special privilege for me this evening, if I may say so, Carter, 
to be present when Michael Sandel, who is a person who has made a brilliant career out of thinking deeply about the most important moral and spiritual questions, meets the University of Notre Dame. I can think of no one who ought to be here more than Michael, but I've learned that this is Michael's first time here, so it's a great occasion. Uh, Michael and I go back a ways. In fact, we go back to uh, from before we met. <laughs> I was reading Michael and learning from Michael, uh, and I'm only a little younger than Michael, not much, uh, when I was trying to figure out just exactly what was wrong with John Rawls' political philosophy. <laughs> I knew it was wrong, but I wasn't quite sure what was wrong uh, uh, with it. And of course, uh, Michael's uh, uh, first book, uh, cast enormous light uh, uh, on, that, uh, on that subject. Uh, Michael, of course, developed a well-deserved reputation for being a powerful critic of a particular kind of liberalism that was most brilliantly uh, represented by uh, the late Professor Rawls, what's sometimes called anti-perfectionist uh, liberalism. Uh, in its later uh, incarnations, it became known as political liberalism. Uh, and this was a view of political philosophy and of liberalism, liberal political philosophy, uh, that involved prescinding, stepping away from, laying aside the deepest and most important moral and spiritual questions for purposes of the design and functioning of uh, political institutions and political societies, at least when it comes to what Professor Rawls called constitutional essentials and matters of basic justice. Uh, in my own work, uh, I have argued for the view that, that that utopian and in some ways heroic uh, project cannot succeed and did not succeed. And if Professor Rawls can't make it succeed, no one can. Michael uh, has argued a very uh, uh, similar line, and our, 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 our views link up in various, uh, in various ways uh, there. Uh, then Michael and I became colleagues uh, on the President's Council on Bioethics, where Carter was our general counsel. He used to prefer the title consigliere, and I'm not quite sure why, but he, the, official, the official title was, was general counsel. Uh, and there I learned that Michael is not only a brilliant scholar, but a good man, a formidable opponent, and a valued ally. I knew uh, him both as an opponent uh, and as uh, an ally. And I have to tell you, I prefer him as an ally. <laughs> uh, on uh, the council, we uh, discussed and considered and tried to help the country in thinking about, under Leon Cass's wonderful chairmanship and then the chairmanship of Edmund Pellegrino, Dr. Pellegrino, lead the country in thinking about some very deep, difficult questions, some of which are relevant to our discussion uh, tonight. Of course, our initial focus and much of the reputation of the council was built on our deliberations on which we achieved no consensus about embryo destructive research, the use of embryos, human embryos uh, in research in which they are uh, destroyed, the question of cloning to produce uh, embryos, a question on which Michael and I were on opposite sides. But we moved from there into questions of genetic enhancement, genetic engineering, uh, related uh, issues on which we found ourselves much more often uh, allied, questions of how the organ donation scheme should work, whether organs should be for sale, whether there should be a market in organs. And that was my own first experience with Michael's thinking about what should be for sale and what shouldn't be for sale, what the limits of markets are, the subject to which he turned his mind uh, in this book after uh, writing on related themes in his book, The Case Against uh, Perfection. Uh, now, as it happens, I'm teaching uh, this semester, I'm on leave from Princeton, and I'm uh, uh, teaching at uh, Harvard where I'm a visiting professor in the law school. And on Tuesday of this week, 
uh, my class uh, will be taking up the embryo question, but not with me. I will not be there. Uh, subbing for me will be my dear friend, Professor Sanford Levinson, who's also a visiting professor at Harvard Law School. And the subject matter and the readings for the, uh, uh, for the uh, session are Michael's case in favor of uh, human cloning and embryonic uh, research, and my case uh, uh, against it. So he'll be teaching, Sandy will be teaching my students the Sandell-George debate. But I'm afraid if you want to hear a debate between Sandell and George, you'll have to go up to Cambridge for the class on Tuesday. Because when it comes to the issues that Michael uh, addresses in the uh, book What Money Can't Buy, The Limits of uh, Markets, uh, we find ourselves much uh, closer in sentiment. Now, this isn't the first time this happened. About a year and a half ago, uh, the two of us were invited to do a public uh, dialogue at Harvard. Uh, this time, it was, a, it was an essay of mine uh, that was uh, on the agenda, an essay that I had done on uh, pornography. And we had a tremendous turnout of students uh, who were there, I think, probably to witness a great uh, debate and confrontation. Uh, but uh, uh, Michael opened, as I'm opening now, and Michael's opening was pretty much like mine now, saying, well, I basically agree with, <laughs> with this, and so I want to raise a few uh, questions for both of us uh, and see how the argument could be uh, uh, developed and whether there are some conundrums here that we, uh, we ought to address. Uh, and that's the position that I find myself uh, in uh, this evening. Let me tell you a little bit about uh, the, the argument. The title makes it obvious, what money can't buy. There are some things that money can't buy, or at least shouldn't buy. There are some things that shouldn't be for sale. There are limits to markets and money when it comes to things that we value. So how do we think about those? What do we, how do we identify? What should be for sale and what shouldn't be for sale? How do we understand intelligently what the limits of markets are? Now, in preparing for this evening, uh, I not only had a look, of course, read uh, Michael's uh, book, but I dipped into some of the criticism uh, in the uh, reviews, and uh, especially criticism by libertarian writers. And those are Michael's main critics when it comes to uh, this particular subject. And uh, I found what uh, I think you would expect to find from a libertarian uh, perspective, uh, the view that uh, Michael underestimates uh, the proper role of markets and uh, uh, condemns markets when he should be praising them or at least uh, neutral uh, toward them that he fails to see the morality, the moral goodness of employing the market, even with respect to some things that Michael and I, and perhaps some of you, think should not be marketable lest they turn into commodities in our own thinking. For example, vital organs that can be used in transplantation. What some of the critics missed and what the first thing I'd like to emphasize is that the book is not an anti-market book. The argument is not an anti-market argument. I don't quite know how they could miss it because it is explicit. It doesn't require inferences. Michael praises the market as a good way of producing and distributing many, many, many important things that make our lives better. It's not a condemnation of the market, not a wholesale condemnation of the market, barely even a retail con uh, uh, condemnation uh, of the market. Michael says, and I completely agree, that the market has proven to be a wonderful mechanism for producing and distributing goods and services, making them more widely available. I'm a great believer myself in the market. One of the things that I like about the market economy is that the market economy 
makes possible upward social mobility. Because we have a market economy in places like the United States, people are able to move from lower socioeconomic stations to higher socioeconomic stations. But Carter kindly pointed out that I myself hold the chair that Woodrow Wilson once held at, uh, at, at Princeton. I, I sometimes think about that, Carter, uh, because when um, Woodrow Wilson held that chair, uh, my uh, grandfather, uh, both of my grandfathers, as a matter of fact, were immigrant coal miners in West Virginia and southwestern uh, Pennsylvania. None of, neither of them had finished college. They were at the bottom uh, of the socioeconomic uh, uh, scale. Woodrow Wilson was Woodrow Wilson at Princeton. Now, less than 100 years later, I was sitting in that chair. That's just one generation between me and them. Now, I tell this story not to say how great I am. It's not what that story is about. Because that story is probably your story. That's the story of vast numbers of Americans. And I think that story is only possible because of the market economy. So I think we should be very, very cautious about anything approaching a kind of wholesale condemnation of the market economy, at least if we believe, as I believe, in creating conditions of upward social mobility. At the same time, I think any sensible person would have to recognize, as even the libertarian critics do recognize, that there have to be limits. Not everything should be for sale. They may draw the line a lot more narrowly than we do. <laughs> But I think everybody understands that there's some things that shouldn't be for sale. Now, some things shouldn't be for sale because they're just bad. They're just evil. They shouldn't be for sale because they shouldn't be out there. I would class recreational drugs in that category. I would class pornography in that category. Slavery, certainly, trading in human beings certainly belongs in that uh, uh, category. There are various things that shouldn't be sold. Markets should not distribute because they shouldn't be available in the first place. Now, how you deal with them, how you deal with the drug plague, that's a policy question that we could debate. But there's not a really powerful, or at least an even credible, it seems to me, argument that we should have recreational drugs widely available. If we could find a way to make them go away, uh, we should. That's not mainly what Michael's argument is concerned with, though. He's concerned with another category of things that shouldn't be for sale, where markets should not be determining distribution of production. And those are things that are, in a sense, too valuable, or at least are valuable in certain sorts of ways that make them inappropriate for market distribution. They are the things money shouldn't be able to buy. They're precious in ways that make it degrading of them and perhaps of us to put them into commerce, to buy them and sell them, to treat them as commodities, including ordinary, as if they were ordinary uh, commodities. Perhaps vital organs belong in that category. Not that they shouldn't be distributed. They're not bad if they're, if they're taken in a morally upright way from people who are actually dead and so forth, very few of us would have objections to them being available. The question is, how should we distribute them? Should the market mechanism be used or not? Our, our dear friend and our, our great leader on the President's Council on Bioethics, Dr. Cass, argued strongly against the distribution of organs in a market system, the sale of organs, on the ground that it would lead to a certain shaping of attitudes toward ourselves that is properly described and criticized as the commodification of human beings. Now, whether organs do or don't belong in that category, I think they do. Whether you think they do or don't, there are some things that are in that category. Now, Michael looks at two ways 
in which we can go wrong uh, by marketizing or using the market as the distribution scheme to problems that we get ourselves into when we err. One is violations of equality, where we distribute things in such a, use the market to distribute things in such a way that certain respects in which we ought to be and treat each other and be treated by political authority and other authority as equal get compromised. An example that occurs to me, I don't remember if it's in Michael's book, an example that occurs to me is the, the practice that we had in this country at one point of paying people to fight for you in a war. If you're conscripted into the service during the Civil War, for example, I believe the going rate was $300, if I remember correctly, uh, you, could, you could pay somebody else to, to fight for you. Uh, Theodore Roosevelt's father, uh, paid someone to fight. Theodore Roosevelt's father was a great man. We, we know about Theodore Roosevelt. Many people don't know about his father. His father was, was a great American, truly a great American. Uh, he, was, he, he was known, uh, they, they called him Great Heart because he was such, a man of such civic mindedness and uh, generosity, a leading figure in the creation of the uh, Museum of Natural History in New York and many, many other worthy uh, causes. But he bought himself out of service. Now, interestingly, even then, it was regarded by many people, including by Roosevelt Sr. himself, as a shameful thing to do. He never really managed to come to terms with the fact that his father had insisted that that be done for him. Uh, the account of Teddy Roosevelt's own remarkable courage which usually focuses on childhood asthma and things like that, I've often thought uh, must have as part of it a kind of need to redeem his father from his father's own internalized belief that he had been cowardly in letting someone buy his place. But Michael's argument on things like that isn't so much about shame and cowardice, though that might well enter into it, as the civic inequality that's involved when one man pays another man to do his civic service in an area which, as citizens of a Republican democracy, we ought to be equals. The Roosevelts were extraordinarily rich. Cornelius Van Schack Roosevelt made it in the plate glass business when there was real money in the plate glass business. Right? And it was that wealth that enabled him to buy his son out of the uh, uh, military military service. But that, Michael argues, and sounds plausible to me, constitutes a kind of violation of the principle of civic equality. Now that is not an argument for radical egalitarianism at all. And you don't have to be a socialist or a collectivist or a radical egalitarian to, to see a problem with, with that. So people who are quick to rush to categorize things politically, really need to be careful here. You shouldn't rush from the judgment that Sandel is a critic of libertarianism, which he is, to the conclusion that he must be a collectivist, which is what some of the libertarian reviews do. Uh, I can draw you a left-wing program <laughs> that would make Michael's view look very libertarian. So it's just not that. I, I, in fact, I wouldn't even want to say that it's somewhere in the middle because that, that gives an image of a spectrum that is too simple to capture, I think, the rather complex reality that we have here. But it's a point about civic equality and the need to be careful about what we marketize lest we, lest we undermine or damage that equality and the spirit that accompanies it, a spirit that really is quite critical for the maintenance and integrity of a Republican scheme of government. The second problem, the second uh, error that we can fall into when we marketize that which shouldn't be marketized, Michael says, is corruption. That's the problem we have, for example, with creating market in organs or markets in other things that 
are too precious or, or are precious in ways that render it inappropriate to put a monetary price on them. It is a corruption when we think of human beings as commodities, not just in the case of slavery, though certainly in that case, but not just there, but even at least arguably in the case of organs. Now, it could be, of course, that there are real costs to not marketizing things like organs. And I think we have to be very sober and realistic if we're going to embrace Michael's argument here, that there could very well be costs. Libertarians like Professor Epstein, Richard, Richard Epstein at, at the University of Chicago, who are passionate, passionately in favor of a more, an organ market, make the moral argument that marketizing organs will save lives. You want more of a product, you want more organs to be available, marketize them. Let there be the sale of organs. Create a market in them. Judge Posner, Richard Posner, argued famously or infamously in a column in the Wall Street Journal years ago that I think permanently sank his chances of ever serving on the Supreme Court of the United States, that we should have a market in babies for adoption. Now that scandalized people. But his argument was that kids will be better off. You'll actually get better parenting with the market than you would without it. Now, I want to submit to you, because I think we need to be very sober and serious about what we're willing to give up in order to avoid the corruption that Michael's warning about here, I want to say that they both might be right. It could be that more lives would be saved with vital organ transplantation if we had a market. It might be that children actually would, on the whole, on average, grow up in better homes if you let the market determine who gets to adopt and who doesn't. And if all you had were, what shall we call them, material considerations in mind, if it was just a matter of saving more lives overall and in the long run, in other words, if our libertarianism were underwritten, as in many cases, beginning with Mill, <laughs> it is, by utilitarianism, it's our underlying moral philosophy, then the argument would go through. It must be because we reject, if we, if, we, if we are scandalized, if we don't want to go down this road, even if it would mean saving lives and better homes for more kids, it's because we don't accept those moral premises and are willing to accept the consequences, the negative side, as part of our picture in refusing to go down a road that will, for example, commodify the human person, cause us and others to treat ourselves as commodities. Now, if you are willing to go down the road that Michael goes down, and I'm willing to go down with him, some questions are left that should be Michael's next book, and perhaps he'll say some things about them uh, this evening. So I want to push now to where we go when we're willing, if we're willing, to bite the bullet and live with the consequences of thinking that there are some things that are too precious or precious in ways that mean that they shouldn't be bought and sold. Michael rightly calls, explicitly calls, he's very Notre Dameish, for a robust civil, civic, and political, and cultural debate about what should be bought and sold, and says explicitly that that is a debate about moral and spiritual matters, and must be carried out robustly as a moral and spiritual debate. This is Michael Sandel, the great critic of anti-perfectionist or political liberalism.
that we cannot exclude on grounds that they are non-public or whatever our deepest convictions about what's good and true and beautiful and ultimate. I think a lot of liberal readers, liberals in the contemporary sense, were probably scandalized when they saw that word spirit. Maybe they can go along with moral. And I learned on the President's Council on Bioethics, usually when we were in adversarial postures, Michael Sandel wasteth not a word. There's not a word there that's not pregnant with me. If it's there, he means it to be there. Spiritual and moral debate. Now that, that's pretty amazing. At least in the cultural context in which university people like ourselves find ourselves. Someone who's saying, let's have it. Let's have that debate. Let's have that debate about fundamental moral and spiritual things, because we can't resolve the question, even for public affairs, of what should be allowed to be bought and sold, babies for adoption, vital organs, without engaging at the fundamental moral and even spiritual level. Now, Michael wants to tell us not only that we need to have that debate, but I would be very surprised, knowing my friend Michael Sandel, if he didn't have some thoughts about how the debate should go and where it should come out. And of course, we get some sense from the various examples. He's got a wonderful use of many, many examples here of things that we probably don't want to and shouldn't subject to the uh, market for distribution. I think Michael has some ideas about what the terms should be, what the proper moral and spiritual uh, philosophies are for thinking it through. And he's willing to debate those with people who would come at it in a different way. But he thinks that debate has to be had. Now that is a debate about what is important and what is not important. What is for the human good and what is against it. Not just in some instrumental way, but what are, if I can borrow uh, the, fa for the, the term made famous by uh, my own uh, mentor, Notre Dame Professor Finnis, what are the basic goods of human nature? What are the basic aspects of human well-being and fulfillment? And what norms of practice, norms of morality, can we identify from the integral directiveness of the aspects of human well-being and fulfillment that are fundamental to us as creatures constituted the way we're constituted, the human good. Once we've called for the debate, we have to have the debate, which means thinking about those issues. What is ultimately important? What is transcendently important? What is fundamental to ourselves, not just as material beings, but as intellectual and spiritual creatures? If we have that debate, that will be in some ways not just an acrimonious debate, but a difficult debate. Because in our circumstances of what Professor Rawls called reasonable pluralism, there are very fundamental disagreements at that level. Those are the disagreements that Rawls wanted to run from, to avoid. He feared the cultural consequences of having the debate on those terms. That's why he wanted to prescind from them. That's why he wanted a political liberalism. Michael's inviting us in. But if we're going to do it, we need to know how we're going to do it in a way that will avoid the consequences that Rawls feared. When you engage fundamental disagreement and you resolve issues democratically on the basis of moral and spiritual concerns. So I think that introduces uh, the book, Michael. I hope I didn't uh, uh, distort it too, uh, too badly, but I'm, I'm, I'm eager to hear your uh, response. Well. Thank you, Robbie, for that very generous, uh, pricey, and 
set of challenges and observations. Uh, and I want also uh, to thank Carter for convening us and, and um, for taking up the leadership of this center. It's really a privilege to be here uh, with Carter and Robbie and with all of you. It's, uh, Robbie has identified the, the big questions of, of moral and political philosophy that rumble beneath the surface of the discussion of markets and the examples of markets and where they do and don't belong. So let me begin, Robbie, with uh, the point on which you ended. It is true that this is mainly a book about the role of money, what should be the, the role of money in markets in a good society. That's the question. But it's connected, just as you say, to these larger debates about liberalism as a moral and political philosophy. Because the main point of the book, quite apart from what it says about this or that use of markets, is that we can't decide these questions without engaging in debates about the good. Um, just as we can't, I would say, identify principles of justice or of basic rights without engaging in debates about the meaning of the good, neither can we decide where markets belong and where they don't. And in a way, this is uncomfortable news, if it's right, for people on both sides of the political spectrum as we traditionally define that spectrum. Those to the left of center might welcome the critique of markets, but worry uh, at my suggestion that a true critique of markets and debate about their role requires that we engage in precisely the substantive moral uh, and spiritual disagreements uh, that many to the left of center want to set aside for just the reason that Robbie says. And it may be discomforting for some to the right of center who may welcome the call for that kind of moral and spiritual uh, engaged public discourse, but may not welcome the critique of markets. And so you've put the philosophical issue at stake here directly and clearly. I think if we look at the shape of our public life and public culture over the last three decades, it's hard not to be struck by two features of it. One is what in the book I call a, a kind of market triumphalism. The last three decades have been a period defined by the faith that markets and market reasoning are the primary instruments for achieving the common good. And that article of faith, that market triumphalist faith, has not really been debated in our politics. And it's not really divided left and right, liberals and conservatives. During these same three decades, something else has been true of our public discourse, and that is that it's been impoverished, hollowed out, largely governed by managerial and technocratic concerns. And the reason for that, I think, is that we have shrunk from a morally more robust kind of public discourse. And I think this, the emptiness, the moral emptiness of political argument in the US over the past three decades is part of what has led to so much frustration and unhappiness across the political spectrum with the terms of public discourse. So these are two tendencies over the past three decades, and I think they're connected. Uh, the reason they're connected, I think, can be seen if we ask ourselves why market reasoning and economic reasoning have so readily displace moral reasoning in much of our public life. 
There's a simple answer, which is markets deliver the goods. Markets have been great engines of prosperity. And this fueled the market triumphalist faith, at least until the financial crisis. But I think that's a very partial diagnosis. I think the deeper appeal, allure, of what I've called the market triumphalist faith lies elsewhere. Not in its having delivered the goods or economic growth or higher GDP or rising affluence, though that's part of it. I think the deep appeal of market reasoning as a way of thinking about public life in questions such as these is that it seems to spare us the need to engage in controversial debates about the good life and about higher goods. Because the deep appeal of markets, apart from wealth and prosperity, is that when two consenting adults agree to a deal to exchange this for that, I'll pay you this if you give me that. It seems as though the parties to the exchange can place their own valuation on the goods they exchange. And there's no further question. And if that's true, it spares the rest of us the need, as a society, to ask how goods and social practices are properly valued. And this, I think, is the, uh, the deep appeal of market reasoning, that it seems to provide a neutral way of valuing goods. But I think that what we, that looking back on these three decades, noticing the tendency of markets and market thinking to reach into spheres of life traditionally governed by other goods, non-market goods, worth caring about, should give us pause. Economists often assume that markets are inert, that they do not touch or taint the goods they exchange. A market exchange doesn't change the character of the good. That's a, a familiar assumption in mainstream economic thinking. And it may be more or less true when the goods at stake are material goods like toasters or cars or flat screen televisions. If you sell me a flat screen television or give me one as a gift, it'll work just the same either way. But the same may not be true when markets govern the exchange and the distribution of non-material goods, goods that derive much of their value from non-market norms in the area of family life, community life, education, health, national service, law and criminal justice, civic life. In these domains, if goods are bought and sold, the character of the good may change. And it may change because the market values may drive out or crowd out or corrupt or degrade attitudes toward those goods that are part of what make them the goods they are. Take a small example. In many school districts around the country, they're trying to, doing experiments to improve academic performance, among, especially among kids from poor backgrounds, by paying for good grades or high test scores, uh, even to read books. They've tried this in New York, in, Cal in, in uh, Chicago, in Washington, D.C. In Dallas, they pay second graders $2 for each book they read. Now, the goal is worthy. We're not talking here about prostitution or um, or activities that, that shouldn't exist. We're trying to encourage the kids to get good grades and to read the books. So the aim is worthy. Why, why even hesitate? Well, the reason to hesitate, first you might say, well, does it work? And in the case of, uh, the, the record has actually been mixed. 
It hasn't worked to raise the grades, though it seems to help with attendance. <laughs> and in Dallas, when they paid the kids $2 for each book they read, the kids did read more books. They also read shorter books. <laughs> but that's the least of it. The real question is, what attitudes toward reading and learning does this market mechanism teach? Because here we're talking about education. Well, to answer that question, we have to reflect on the goal of the activity, the purpose, or the end. Now, part of the purpose is to get kids to get better grades, to try harder in school, to read more books. So when we ask, does it work? Well, we can posit that immediate end and see. But, of course, that's not the fully adequately characterized end or goal or purpose of education, to get kids to read more books, not as such. It's also to cultivate the love of learning for its own sake, the love of reading. And so the reason we hesitate, if we do hesitate, about some, some call it bribing kids to read, that already builds in the, the ground of hesitation, is that it's using the wrong motive and teaching the wrong attitude toward reading. Now, you might say, well, the kids, if they're paid, could turn out well. It could be that they read initially for the wrong reason, and they get hooked on reading, and they stay not for the money, but for the love of reading, in which case all will be well. But it could also turn out the other way, that what they learn is that reading is a form of piecework, a chore to be done for pay, in which case when the money stops, so may be the reading. A friend of mine pays his young children. He's, actually, he's a professor. I won't say more than that. He pays his young kids $1 for each thank you note they write. I've received some of these thank you notes. <laughs> And I can tell by reading them that they were written under a certain pressure. <laughs> My wife and I look askance at this practice, and we wonder how these kids will turn out. Now, it, it could be that by being paid to write thank you notes, they'll get in the habit of writing them, and will, this would be the Aristotelian account, that they'll get in the habit of writing them and eventually, they'll learn the real reason, the proper reason for writing them, in which case, when the money stops, they'll carry on writing thank you notes. They'll learn the virtue of gratitude, and all will be well. But it could also turn out the other way. It could turn out that what they learn is that writing a thank you note is something you do for money, in which case, when the money stops, so will the thank you notes. They may never learn the virtue of gratitude, and their moral education may be corrupted. And so what I'm suggesting is that the more money reaches into spheres of life governed by higher goods, the more we need to worry and reflect and deliberate about whether the corrosive effect of money on higher goods will be corrupting, which is uh, the, the second argument that Robbie emphasized, the argument from corruption. There are, and I want to just say a word because he laid it out clearly and beautifully, there are, of the two arguments to worry about markets reaching into every sphere of life, the first is the more familiar, the worry about equality and also fairness and coercion connected to equality. So for example, uh, take the practice, now the global practice, the global trade in surrogate motherhood. Uh, some states in the United States permit surrogate motherhood, others don't. Uh, others, in other cases, the laws are ambiguous. But in any case, it's expensive in the United States. It uh, costs seventy-five dollars to $100,000 uh, to pay for a surrogate uh, pregnancy, about 25000 to the to the uh, person who's hired, the woman who's hired to carry the child, but then legal fees and medical fees. So India recently 
legalized paid commercial surrogacy to try to create employment for impoverished Indian women. And it can be done in India for a quarter to a third the price. And so now we have the outsourcing of paid pregnancy to India. Now, you might object to this on the grounds of, on grounds of coercion and inequality, that the, an Indian peasant who agrees to carry a child for money, or for that matter, to sell her kidney, is not really acting freely, but is effectively coerced by the necessity of her condition. That's, a, that's the first kind of objection that worries about equality and coercion. And that's a familiar uh, strand of argument in our political debate. But I'm eager to emphasize the second argument, as, as Robbie rightly distinguished it, which is not, about, not only about figuring out, is this coercion given the unequal background conditions, but is it corrupt? And what can be corrupted is either the social practice itself or the people engaged in the transaction. So to answer that question, and this is why it's philosophically and politically more difficult to make out this objection. To answer that question, we have to reason about the proper ends of, in this case, pregnancy and parenting. And that, to reason about the proper end of parent, uh, procreation and parenting, is to reason about higher goods. And people disagree about that, and that, that implicates moral and spiritual convictions, which is why we shy away from it. Um, it's much easier and more familiar, in a way, to argue about, is this really coercive or not? And so what I'm trying to direct our attention to is precisely the second range of considerations, as Robbie, uh, Robbie emphasized them, which takes us on, onto this terrain about higher goods and reasoning about the purpose or end of social practices, whether procreation or pregnancy or national service um, or education, teaching and learning. It's more difficult not only because it's more contested and because it implicates moral and spiritual questions. It's, um, it's certainly that, but also because the argument has to be made in a different way, case by case. With the coercion and inequality objection, it's always a version of that same principle. Is it really free, this exchange? Is it truly voluntary, or, or is it coerced? And we just run that, with whether it's organ sales, or whether it's paid pregnancy, or whether it's buying your way into the military when Andrew Carnegie or TR's father offers the money. But in the case of the debate about higher goods and the proper way of valuing social practices, we have to reason about those goods in a different way, case by case, because the answer may be, well, the goods at stake are different in the case of procreation from what's at stake when we're talking about the environmental protection, for, uh, or when we're talking about teaching and learning, or wh when we're talking about national security. Different goods are at stake. Different purposes have to be argued through. So not only is this more contested terrain morally and spiritually, but it requires that we take up the argument about the character of the goods and the proper way of valuing social practices in a different way and have it out each time. So we could perhaps get into some of those different settings where these questions arise, but that seems to me the philosophical hard question and, and what's politically so difficult about trying to encourage this kind of morally more robust debate in a public life, where public discourse, that has largely been emptied, I think, of moral and spiritual resonance and argument. I think it's important. Am I on? Uh, I think it's important to, um, to see that Michael's focusing our attention here on one set of moral problems moral disputes. Uh, and it's a very important set and should never be neglected. Uh, but I think we need to avoid the temptation, which Michael avoids in the book, but I think all of us need to avoid, 
of supposing that the only problems that arise in these areas are problems uh, that have to do with money being involved or money changing hands. Take a case like surrogacy. I don't think we should be lulled into supposing that if we just got the money out of the business, all the moral problems would go, to, go away. You only have commodification because you have money. But there's a debate to be had about surrogacy that has to do with issues that don't have anything to do with whether money's exchanged, whether that kind of instrumentalization of the, of the body is corrupting or, or not, is, is uh, suitable. Uh, right, could, could I just, yeah. Uh, yeah. because maybe here there is a germ of a disagreement, getting back to some, but in the case of surrogacy, I, if you imagine, I agree that instrumentalization is the thing that's morally worrisome here. Um, if it were a matter of nothing to do with markets or money, but a sister who was willing out of love to bear a child for uh, a sister, her sister who was incapable of doing it, I would view that as very morally, uh, as morally a different matter from uh, the hiring out the paid pregnancy case. W would you view I, I it would differently? Disagree. Yeah, yeah. That's right. All right. So but we would ahead. be having an important moral debate where money is not what's yeah. in the picture. Uh, we, we would not disagree about whether she was acting out of love or right. anything like that any, any more than we would disagree with our friend Richard Epstein about whether we should, other things being equal, try to save more lives rather than, than, right. than fewer lives. But it would be a debate about whether, about the morality of surrogacy independently of, of money changing hands. Because mm -hmm. there, there, there are some things, I'm sure you can think of some things yourself, if not surrogacy, that you, whether you would get the law involved at all is another question, but that you would advise against doing on moral grounds, even if it didn't involve yeah. money, yeah. Uh, money sure, changing of course. hands. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, another point that I think uh, it's important to make is this. Uh, I mentioned that this is not, this book and this argument is not an attack on the market. As I said, Michael very explicitly praises the market for the great good that it has done and can do, and, and we'd be in bad shape with, uh, without it. Um, but I think it is important in the rhetoric to avoid using language, and it might be that, that terms like market values create this risk, or market reasoning creates this risk. I think it's important in the rhetoric to avoid the suggestion that there is the domain of the market, which is the individualistic Wild West, and then there are other domains like family that are different and inappropriate for those libertarian, individualistic Wild West more moral, free, free of morality type uh, uh, considerations. I, market values and market reasoning should, if we understand the market correctly, include principles that are moralistic or that are moral. Principles like fairness. That's part of the picture in having a properly functioning market. When we, when we in contract law, uh, uh, create a category of duress, for example. I think that reflects a, a larger moral understanding that controls this domain of the market and market relations, which is by no means a kind of moral Wild West. That there, there are moral principles that are part of markets. They, they are market, part of market, but they're among the values, if you want to call them values as opposed to principles that pertain uh, to the market, and they're part of market, market reasoning. Now, that, that doesn't mean that there's anything wrong with the argument that you present, but I, I just have a little bit of a concern about that, that rhetoric. When I, I, I have these kinds of discussions often with my friend Cornell West, with whom, I, with, with whom I teach frequently, and when he refers to market values and contrasts them with what he regards as superior values, He's got this idea of the market as the moral wild west. And so he's much more critical of market values than you or I would be. And I suspect that he's much more critical 
because his image of the market itself is not one that includes the moral principles that I think we find, for example, in our contract law. Well, what I mean by market values is really something quite um, specific, it, and it goes to your language about commodification or instrumentalization. Um, what I mean by it is treating a good or a social practice as a commodity, as an object of use and profit. And I think that to uh, the moral assumption that is often buried in um, market overreach is the idea that in principle, every good and every social practice can be treated can be traded for money, and therefore, by definition, um, can be treated as a commodity or as an object of profit and use. And it's that assumption that I want to challenge in these domains outside the domains of flat screen televisions and toasters. That once we get into anything from procreation to citizenship to health to education and so on, uh, we need to ask, before we decide to buy and sell the thing or, or to have the practice governed by, by market exchange, is it properly, is this good properly treated as, regarded and treated as a thing or as an object of profit and use? That's, that would be the question that I would ask. And that's, that's what I mean by market valuation. And market reasoning. Yes, there are other, other features of market reasoning. Um, the, there are two assumptions that are familiar in standard mainstream textbook economic reasoning or market reasoning that I uh, would like to challenge. One is the one that we've been discussing, which is that uh, market exchange does not change the character of the goods. Uh, and there, I say, where the, the good is partly constituted, where its values consist in certain attitudes expressed toward it, a market value can, a market exchange can crowd out or corrupt those attitudes. The other, the second assumption that's very familiar in economic reasoning, standard economic reasoning, is an idea that is rarely defended, but often relied upon by economists, including very good ones. And that's the idea that benevolence, Charity, altruism, solidarity, fellow feeling, and civic virtue are uh, maybe precious, but we need to conserve them, not spend them down. The, it's the idea that the generous virtues are commodities that are depleted with use. The more you use them, the less you have them. And this comes up in, in, in surprising ways. There was this famous study about uh, blood, blood donation, by the sociologist Richard Titmus in the early 70s, where he compared the US and the UK system of uh, the blood supply. In Britain, blood was only donated. In the US, it could be donated or bought and sold. He tried to show on empirical grounds it actually worked better when it could only be donated in Britain. But he also made a moral argument, and his moral argument was that by allowing blood to be bought and sold, a society undermines the gift relationship among persons and it's corrosive of altruism generally. This was his argument. His book was reviewed by uh, Kenneth Arrow, who was one of the most distinguished uh, economists of his time. And actually, I've got, if I could just read a sentence or two from Arrow. Arrow had a hard time seeing why. If you add the opportunity to buy and sell something, no law says you can't continue to donate it if you want to. There's no law against altruism, against gift giving. So adding the possibility of buying and selling blood could only increase 
the supply. Those who want to carry on giving it can give, and then those who are motivated by money can sell. And, and he, um, he, put it, he put it this way. He said, if to a voluntary blood donor system we had the possibility of selling blood, we've only expanded the individual's range of alternatives. If he derives satisfaction from giving, he can still give, and nothing has been done to impair that right. Why should it be that the creation of a market for blood would decrease the altruism embodied in giving blood? Well, uh, and yet it does. And this, uh, this is what many economists, including very gifted economists, miss. I mean, consider, uh, consider this. In a, in a world where blood is routinely bought and sold, what becomes of the act of giving it? Is donating a pint of blood at your local Red Cross still an act of generosity? Or is it an unfair labor practice that deprives needy persons of gainful employment selling their blood? Or if you wanted to contribute to a blood drive, would it be better to donate the blood yourself, you might wonder? Or to donate $50 that can be used to buy an extra pint of blood from a homeless person who needs the income? A would-be altruist could be forgiven for being confused. But related to this is the idea that ethical behavior in general, or, or altruism, or benevolence, needs to, itself to be economized. Uh, and this, this was also, uh, uh, Arrow ended his review of, of Titmus saying this, like many economists, I do not want to rely too heavily on substituting ethics for self-interest. I think it best on the whole that the requirement of ethical behavior be confined to those circumstances where the price system breaks down. We do not wish to use up recklessly the scarce resources of altruistic motivation. Now, if this is true, this economistic conception of virtue, then it provides a powerful reason for using markets wherever one can so as not to deplete the limited supply of the generous virtues. Um, but there is another way of thinking about how the generous virtues are cultivated, which goes in just the opposite direction, which is that they increase with use rather than are diminished as if they were fossil fuels. The, the, more, the more you use, the less you have. The, 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 I think, better analogy would be and not the fossil fuel analogy, but the, the idea of a muscle. The more you use it, the, the more it flourishes, the more it's, it's available. Aristotle certainly thought of the virtues that way. He, he would have been puzzled by the thought that we would acquire the virtues by abstaining from relying on them. Yeah. To the contrary. Yeah. Yeah. We cultivate them by using them. And here's just, uh, I have to read just one other uh, quote. Larry Summers, when he was president of Harvard, gave a speech in the Memorial Church, the morning prayer, and it was on what economics can contribute to thinking about moral questions. And he concluded by saying this, we all have only so much altruism in us. Economists like me think of altruism as a valuable and rare good that needs conserving. So here you see, see it again, far better to conserve it by designing a system in which people's wants will be satisfied by individuals being selfish and saving that altruism for our families, our friends, and the many social problems in this world that markets cannot have. Well, I think that part of the problem with the market-driven society that we have become is precisely that it lets these generous virtues, these civic virtues, languish. I think we would be better that uh, better than trying to conserve these virtues, that we exercise them uh, and call upon one another to exercise them more strenuously. One of, the, uh, one of the goods that I think most people would say should not be uh, marketized is the good of friendship. I mean, a paid friendship wouldn't be much of a friendship at all, would it be? I mean, uh, Although there was, for a time, a website where you could go if you wanted more Facebook friends, 
Oh, okay. And you could buy them <laughs> for 99 cents a piece <laughs> <laughs> per month. <laughs> well, Carter seems very familiar with this service. <laughs> I, was, uh, I was a model for the Facebook friends. <laughs> yeah, that's how Michael and I met each other. Yeah. Well, I bring this up because uh, the review of the book uh, in the Cato Journal, which this would be from Libertarian headquarters. Uh, Is this your usual reading, Robbie? Yeah. The, the, uh, only, only, only when I'm preparing to defend you, Michael, on those occasions. <laughs> um, the... Uh, the Cato Journal uh, review brings up this issue. It wants to tackle the toughest case. So it says, okay, yeah, you know. Michael Sandel says, take for example, friendship, something that can't be bought or sold. It changes the nature of the thing. If, if it's for sale, then it, it just can't be, whatever it is, I don't know what we call it, but it's not friendship. And uh, what does the reviewer do? Well, he, he, he goes where you or I might uh, uh, go, and I was surprised to find him there, and that is straight to Aristotle where he says, ah, but Aristotle himself says that there are friendships of utility or business uh, friendships uh, where the relationship uh, is motivated by the individual, uh, the desires of the individual partners to achieve goals extrinsic to the, uh, to the friendship only more fully and uh, efficiently than they could achieve them uh, operating just as, uh, as, uh, as individuals. But of course, that is not what we mean <laughs> focally uh, in the central case. I mean, that's a, that's a very watered down case of, uh, of uh, what we mean by, uh, by friendship. And his only response to the question of real friendship was, well, what, does Sandel think it's a big surprise that people don't, you know, value, uh, people don't uh, put a monetary value on friendship? But then I was thinking, in a way we do, and it's not just these Facebook cases, and, it, and this led me to wonder about the broader social criticism that might come out of the kind of reflection that Michael has invited us to do. Think of the paid companions now that are so important in the lives of so many elderly people. And it's clear from the advertising that what is on offer is not simply cooking and light housework, or even what you might call adult babysitting. I think sometimes called adult babysitting. That's probably not a, not a proper term. But it's clear that what's on offer is companionship, something very much like friendship. And I have no doubt, even from the very limited experience I have with uh, an elderly friend who died recently, but who had a paid companion uh, in the last years of his life, I have no doubt that true friendships can form between uh, the companion and the elderly, uh, elderly person. But I do wonder about that. The, you know, the, the, is, is, is that like paying the kid for the thank you notes? Would it be like paying for blurbs for your books? We don't mind being paid for writing articles or people being paid for writing articles or for writing books. But we probably would object to people being paid to say nice things which we can put as endorsement on the book jackets, even if it was broadly accepted that there's an ethical code that you don't accept the money to say something that you wouldn't say without the money. Like for articles, right? I mean, just because you're paid for an article, we assume that you observe the ethical code of saying what you really think and not Paying, getting paid to say something in an article that tricks people into believing uh, that this is really your, uh, your, your view. So now, what do we think about these paid companions for the elderly? Now, one thing that would pop immediately into my mind is, how did we get ourselves into a situation where elderly people are in need of paid friendships, marketized friendships? Uh, what does that say about us? Now, that's a complicated story and not all bad about, about us. I mean, we live in a modern society with uh, incredible, un human, in human history, I'm sure it's unprecedented, this kind of, of, of just geographic mobility because of our transportation technology. People often live, sometimes for necessary reasons, far away from their elderly parents and uh, grandparents. But, you know, that's not the, that's not the whole picture. Why do we assume that 
we're not somehow responsible for being there more for our elderly parents and, and, and grandparents? Why are we satisfied to think, well, you know, they've got Social Security now, or they've got their retirement mm -hmm. accounts, their 401ks, you know, it's, why as a society aren't we worried about this issue of the detachment of elderly people mm -hmm. from the rest of us? Why aren't we more worried that kids don't spend more time with their grandparents mm -hmm. and things like that. So I, what I'm suggesting here is only that the concern about the paid companion friendship could be the trigger for a larger self-critical look on a very important issue. And of course, people are living longer than they did. I mean, grandparents used to die uh, or, earlier. Now they, they live on and on and on. Uh, it, it, we're blessed by that. My, uh, my, I, I have, my, my kids grew up with all four grandparents. I mean, in my generation, I mean, I didn't, and it was, it was very rare for people to grow up with all four grandparents. My kids are 26 and 24, same age as Michael's. They've got all four grandparents. Now they're in their late 80s, and you know, the, the, the way this is gonna happen is it'll, it'll come boom, 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 and that'll be, that'll be hard. It won't be spread out over a period of time when the time does come. But anyway, the, it's, that, it's that kind of social criticism that I think the book, uh, but you don't have a chance to go into that in the book, but it's something that I think is worth uh, thinking about. Let me, let me ask you a question. You all have agreed on a, a, lot, a wide range of, of issues, and the, the sort of the most interesting question are those goods that, that can be sold, not like friendship and honor, but things right. can actually be sold that shouldn't be sold, right. not because of egalitarian concerns, but because of corrupting concerns. And both of you agree that the way to grapple with those questions, which we haven't done a good job of, is to have a robust, rich discussion about the good and the try to draw some lines about mm -hmm. what sorts of goods should we not uh, market, what sort of goods, even if there are great consequences. So for example, in the organs, you might admit a scenario in which we're not going to allow a market in organs, even though we admit the possibility that it might result in more deaths. It might not, but, if it, but that's in some ways an immaterial element. I'd, I'd like to ask you both to think a little bit about how to sort of operationalize your, your prescription, which is to say, how do we talk about these issues uh, in a nation of 300 million, a federalist, uh, pluralistic, you know, a country like ours, without devolving into a, another reductive form of trying to identify preferences, which is why we're attracted to market reasoning to begin with, right? Well, it's, it's neutral. It's just figuring out how much a person's willing to pay right. is how much they value it. And in some ways, our political discussion is reductive in the same way. How do we have this discussion that you both agree uh, we, we, should, we should engage? Well, I would begin by answering, by picking up on Robbie's last example, the outsourcing of filial obligation, let's say. I think that um, to reflect about what we buy and sell is a way of engaging in critical reflection about the way we live. And this would be a good example. Uh, another example, and uh, Carter, this may be a concrete illustration in reply to yours, goes back to the example Robbie raised early on in this conversation about the Civil War system that enabled draftees who had the money and didn't want to serve in the Civil War to hire a substitute to take their place. And in some ways, now many people would shrink from that, would reject that, would find that morally uncomfortable, that plan. And yet, we commonly accept a universalized version of that, which is called the All-Volunteer Army. We've decided to allow the labor market to allocate military service universally. And maybe the Civil War buyout provision was jarring because it was against the background of conscription, which presupposed shared obligation. And you might say that when Andrew Carnegie or Teddy Roosevelt's uh, grandfather uh, bought his way out, it was, um, it was a conspicuous example of outsourcing a civic duty. But now we do it as a matter of course. That's what we do when we assign the labor market. We call it, in fact, the all-volunteer army, which is a kind of euphemism. It's not like a, a volunteer fire department where the people just show up and there's a fire. Uh, uh, the the so-called volunteer army is a, a paid, paid army. army. It's a paid army where the labor market allocates who will serve which is, in a way, precisely what went on when someone could hire a substitute in the Civil War. So should we be 
uncomfortable, if we're uncomfortable about the one, should we raise questions about what we've got now? And not only that, why, what would be wrong in principle with a mercenary army? In fact, in Iraq and Afghanistan, there were more paid military contractors on the ground than there were U.S. military troops. This is not because we had a public debate about whether we wanted to outsource war to private companies, but this is what happened. And so to take one example, uh, Carter, of what this debate might look like, we might start with the historical example that seems troubling to a lot of people. What, you can buy your way out of military service? And then notice the way we do it now, not only with a paid army, but for that matter with private contractors. And then ask and debate whether, what are the relevant similarities and differences, morally speaking, and from the standpoint of the idea of civic duty underlying it, of these different ways of allocating military service. And if we had that debate, we would find ourselves debating the goods associated with civic life and shared sacrifice, which we don't debate very much. In fact, I've noticed that when we talk about those who serve in the military today, and this is true across the political spectrum, it is with a kind of veneration for their sacrifice and appreciation, and that's as it should be. But it's almost as if part of what animates the veneration of the sacrifice is that the sacrifice now, we, and we realize this with part of ourselves, is so sequestered, so confined to a tiny proportion of the population. Well, this would be a debate worth having about higher goods. It might lead uh, to, to an argument about whether there should be some form of universal uh, service, universal national service, let's say. Uh, whether it might include military service and other forms of service could be a part of that debate. But it, it might begin with a concrete case that most people would find troubling. Debate analogies with the way we allocate military service now, the views of civic duty that underlie that, the possible alternatives to that, and so it would go. And we won't agree, we won't agree, but still we might make some headway to reasoning by analogy, pointing to competing conceptions of what's, what it means to be a citizen. That, I think, would be at least a healthier kind of debate and a and morally more robust debate from the one that we have today about military service. Let me give you a couple of uh, different examples that point in the same uh, direction. Uh, we generally react negatively toward the idea of regressive taxes, yet we embrace state-sponsored gambling, state lotteries, yeah. casinos, and, and so forth, which are very hard to distinguish from regressive tax. I mean, the effect is the same effect as a, as a regressive tax. Now, we've virtually addicted ourselves in the yeah. states yeah. to these things, and we use the money for good purposes, for programs for the elderly, for programs for education, and so forth. But, you know, a really robust, serious debate would focus our attention on the fact that what we've got going on here, whether we like it or not, might as well face up to it. Let's say, let's speak the truth out loud about what we're doing. This is a, re a regressive tax. An another example would be, you know, most people still think that sex for money is a degrading of ourselves, a degrading of our sexuality, this very profound, important thing that makes marriage possible and so forth, very human good. Um, but we don't treat the paying of actors who perform sex acts in pornographic movies as being guilty of prostitution. We don't ban that, and the Supreme Court, it looks like, won't even li let us treat them the same, although they're very hard to distinguish. And then, of course, if we, take, if, if, if we, if we decide, well, they're really not distinguishable, it's, it's not far from there to be asking the question, well, should we, shouldn't we be trying to do everything we can to stop the product, production of pornography even when it doesn't involve anything more than simulated sexual acts? But it's a similar robust debate that we seem to want to avoid. Mm -hmm. Now, Carter, to address 
in more general terms your question, and I'd be very curious to hear Michael, uh, Michael, Michael's response to this, how do 300 million Americans debate this question? And I say this not in a critical mode at all. It's the reality, and I don't have any problem with it. I mean, the reality is we would debate it drawing on the wisdom of our traditions of faith. Where else are we going to go? I mean, this isn't 300 million professional moral philosophers. And they'd probably do better than the professional moral philosophers if people were really felt free to, uh, to do it. I, I think it's a bad thing to have caused people to internalize the idea that if they're drawing on the resources of their faith, the wisdom of their traditions of faith, in debating matters of public policy, they're doing something that's illegitimate, something they even maybe have to hide. Mm -hmm. That's a bad thing, but it's exactly what we as a culture have done. Now, to say that, of course, is not to say that it should all be, all be about, you know, drawn in that way. You, you know the kind of philosophy I do, right? Uh, so, you know, I'm not going to make the argument that it should all just be drawing from the, tradition, the, wisdom, the wisdom of traditions. And obviously, one of the great things about pluralism is to, is to be able to make the arguments effectively in the political sphere. People have to do some translation of the language in which the ideas were formed in the particular tradition of faith into a more public kind of language. And I think we can acknowledge the, the necessity and virtue of that without slipping into Rawlsianism and, uh, and uh, epistemic abs abstinence and so forth. Uh, so Michael, what do you think about those considerations? Religion as the way this would be debated if we went down the road that you and I agree we should go. Well, I think that religious traditions and faith traditions should uh, inform and be drawn into public discourse. I very much agree with that. I, I think that uh, we should have the ki a kind of public discourse that welcomes all comers, those who uh, draw upon faith and those who draw upon secular moral arguments should be uh, welcome in the public square. I think no one should be asked to leave his or her um, moral, religious, or spiritual convictions at the door before entering the public square. And yes, we will have disagreements, though we can never know in any given case whether we will ultimately disagree until we try. And uh, I think it's also true that we, um, that we can't uh, reason about justice and rights without bringing in a moral and religious and spiritual tradition. So I'm in favor of a more capacious public reason than, than, uh, than uh, some versions of liberal public reason advanced by, by the philosophers would, would insist upon. Should we see if there are people here? Yes, let's open the floor to some questions. Uh, now that we've had this wonderful conversation, we'd love to hear from, from you all. Yes, sir, over here. Hello, my name is Paul Baumgartner. I'm from the University of Michigan. Uh, I'd first like to thank both of you for coming and, and speaking today. My question is directed to both of you, and it has to do with the robust civic debate that you have really surrounded this entire discussion on, and it's what exactly do you foresee the role of, of political parties, but most particularly party leadership being in this robust civic debate over the good? Um, on, on the one hand, in democracy's discontent, Sandel argued, I thought fairly compellingly, that an imperative part of the public good presidential elections of 1860 and 1912 were the party leaders, and that these questions of the public good could not have been answered or developed without the role of many of these party leaders. But on the other side, recent party ID scholarship shows that more Americans are disenfranchised and cynical towards their party leadership than they have been in past generations. So can you just spell out for me and for the audience, the extent to which you think party leadership should be involved in either guiding or even just being active in um, the robust civic discourse that you propose? Ideally, uh, political candidates and political parties should be um, uh, leaders in fostering this kind of civic discourse. But as a practical matter, I don't think we can wait for them or, <laughs> or rely on them. Um, because they have not done very well 
of late. And so I think that this is a much bigger project that requires um, our finding and creating uh, spaces for a more robust kind of moral discourse within the institutions of civil society. And ultimately, the politicians and the political parties will respond if we demand more of them, and if we demand better, and if we, and if we insist on a more elevated terms of public discourse. But I think we need to change the way the media uh, organizes political uh, arguments. I think institutions of higher education, uh, colleges and universities have a role to play in fostering the capacity for this kind of reasoned public discourse among students, I think that the public schools have a role to play, but so do religious communities, uh, so does the labor movement, um, so do groups within uh, social movements and groups within civil society. So I think we should look for multiple sites of, of moral argument and civic engagement, and eventually we may be able to uh, encourage and provoke and inspire and demand that politicians and political parties do better at it than they've done in recent times. The political uh, commentator and independent scholar uh, uh, Jeffrey Bell, whose work I greatly admire, uh, makes the point looking at American history that uh, you know, ordinarily the, the real party leaders are the presidents and presidential candidates. That's really how it, how it works. It's not Reince Priebus and Debbie Wasserman uh, Schultz, or, or for that matter, really, uh, Harry Reid or, or Mitch, Mitch McConnell, or even Nancy uh, Pelosi. It's, it's complicated, but, basic, but I think there's a lot of truth in what Bell says about the importance of presidents. And he also makes the point that the real airing of serious issues, especially serious issues uh, that have moral components to them, it could be economic as well, but those economic issues that have very serious moral components and more broadly, uh, moral, morally serious issues don't really get a proper airing in the United States until they become issues in presidential campaigns. So if you really want to get the thing argued out, the one office that we all vote for <laughs> is, is the president, and that's where it, it has to happen. We have a big issue now about the nature and meaning of marriage just a huge issue. It's obviously critically important. Both sides understand this as a profound moral issue. Uh, now, there's a certain libertarian view that says that you can just take this out of politics, abolish it, it shouldn't be in politics, government should be out of the marriage business. Uh, Cass Sunstein uh, argues that. Some other more libertarian-oriented people uh, argue that. But if, like me, you think that's not a good idea, that, that, that the political community has a vital stake uh, in the health of the and vibrancy of the institution of marriage in the, in the marriage culture because marriage produces children. Men, when men and women get together, you end up with children and you know, nature will ensure that if a baby's born, there's a woman somewhere nearby. But if you're gonna ensure that there's a man somewhere nearby to assist the woman in bringing up the child and to, to be a father and to bring up the father in the love between the mother and father, uh, then nature doesn't provide that. That's got to be provided by culture, and the way culture provides that is, is marriage. But now we have this big debate about the meaning of marriage, which is part of a, of a larger debate that's not just about whether marriage should, should be same sex or opposite sex, but about the divorce culture, the, the problem of marit marital disintegration, the failure of fa families to form, cohabitation large out of wedlock birth rates, especially in poor communities with all the consequences that follow. You would think that this is something we really need to have a robust moral debate upon, drawing on all the resources that Professor Sandel was talking about, religious, secular, and so forth, all the institutions. But we don't really have that. Don't really have that at the presidential level. Certainly didn't in this recent election or the one before that or the one before that, even though these, these, this issue was on the table. You know, Governor Romney would say as little about it as possible. President Obama went from, I'm against this, to I'm for this, to I'm, no, to, from, I'm for it, then I'm against it, then I'm, I'm, I'm for it again, but without any real engagement on the issue. And however you come down, this is an issue that's got to be engaged because of its profound public significance and its significance for children and for the economic well-being, the, the overall well-being, but including the economic well-being of, 
of, uh, of people, given what we know about the consequences of family fragmentation and fatherlessness. So I think the answer to your question is yes, party leaders are very important. The reality is party leaders are presidents and presidential candidates who assume the mantle of the, of the party. But it's up to us to force them to engage the issue, because be anything of that nature that's controversial and difficult, they're going to want to avoid, just as President Obama and Governor Romney wanted to avoid it. Yes, sir. <clears throat> James Kushner from Touchstone Magazine in Chicago. I want to thank both of you for a very stimulating and enlightening uh, discourse. Um, and, and nobody paid me a dollar to say that. Uh, anyway. Do we need to have a debate about the market as a concept? Um, it is a human endeavor. It's, it's almost as if the market is viewed as a impersonal, almost evolutionary kind of force. Since it's a subset of the human being, isn't the more fundamental question, perhaps, what are human beings for? And if that's the question, then what is the market for? And then may maybe we have a, a view of a market that is skewed so that we're afraid of it touching certain things, that it touches certain things, then it, it corrupts them or creates inequalities. That's my question. Uh, th this is uh, Jim, Jim Kushner, the editor of the wonderful journal Touchstone uh, Magazine, which if you haven't read, you should look at. Uh, Jim, uh, what you're saying, I think, is exactly what Professor Sandel was opening up for us and laying some stress on. If you're going to go there to where Michael wants us to go in order to answer the kinds of questions he's raised in the book, what is and what isn't appropriate in a market? and to engage deeply questions of justice and rights, you're going to ask fundamental questions about what is the nature of the human person. What is the human good? What are we beyond the visible material that, that, we, that we see? What's the point of it all? These are big, meaning of life questions. And they're so profound and scary that I can understand why a certain kind of political philosopher would want to avoid them if possible. I, I, can, I, I, I respect the motive of Professor Rawls completely. I get it. Because they're big, important, and profound, and scary, they can also be extremely divisive. And who knows what comes for the society and for its cohesion if you allow them to be, in, to be engaged. But the answer to your question is yes. I, I wouldn't put it just the way you put it, what are human beings for? But I get what you're after, and I would ask, what is the nature of a human person? What is the good of the human person? How do we understand the good of the human person integrally? What norms of justice and human rights and other norms of conduct follow from the integral directiveness of the various aspects of human well-being? Because if we know one thing, it's that human well-being is not just one thing. It's variegated. But those are the big meaning of life questions. It means you know, bringing Plato back to the table. I think we have time for one more question. Melissa, would you like to finish for us? So um, I was thinking about the example of the school children being given $2 to read you know, for every book that they, that they read. And obviously, I see how that corrupts the value of education, the value of reading as an intrinsic good, which is part of what you're trying to teach the children in that example, so that it seems to defeat itself. But then I thought to myself, well, isn't that how most moral education works? That you use an incentive which is less than a full intrinsic appreciation of the good at stake, uh, and then in hopes that, and along the way, you explain the value of it in hopes that then, through habituation, and then also through uh, eventual sort of understanding of the good at stake, they start to do it for the right reasons, right? We do this all the time. We say, well, if you don't do your homework, you're not gonna get dessert. Right, so how's that different from the, or if you, uh, or, or, you know, slightly different than punishment, but say, well, do your homework for mommy, because you love mommy, right? And that's, oh, wow. you know, it's, it's still not about the learning, it's about your love for mom, right? There's a, you're adding a different affective motivation there. Uh, and we also do this in laws, right? Sometimes we try to prevent people from doing things that we think are destructive by uh, providing criminal sanctions, or 
to get people to do things that we think are helpful by providing incentives, things like tax breaks for charitable giving. So I was wondering where do we draw the line yeah. on those things and which sorts of incentives are corrupting the way that the $2 reading a book incentive is corrupting and which sorts of incentives are helpful for moral education? Michael, do you want to take that? Well, I thank you for that, that question. Uh, reflecting on it, I, I don't think I ever did tell <coughs> uh, either of my kids to do their homework because they, uh, I would love them if they did it or <laughs> something like that. I would consider that more corrupting than offering them $2, $2 to do their homework. Uh, not because you would love them, but because, because they love you. Because you love mommy. Yeah. No, it's, because you love mommy, you should do your homework. Right. That I think I would worry about at least as much as the other. <laughs> I wouldn't want to get it balled up with that. It, um, I think that the, um, it's certainly true that from a lower motive, something higher can come. That's the Aristotelian picture and the, the hopeful scenario that I was laying out with regard to the thank you notes and the paying kids to read. Uh, I don't think that it's possible to answer your question um, in, by line drawing or saying, where do we not go with money? I think that the answer that um, I think that what matters is not to draw a line, because the lines will differ depending on and be matters of judgment, depending on the situation. Is it reading or is it looking after one's health? What are we trying to teach young people to do? It will differ, and it will differ by age. But what I do think is important is that where we offer financial incentives, which we concede to be lower motives, not the ones we're aiming at, as a way to kickstart healthy behavior, or respectful behavior, or gratitude, or the love of learning, that even where it works, in fact, especially where it works, we have to keep alive our understanding that it's bribery we're engaged in. Bribery in the broad moral sense of the term. Trafficking in a lower motive for the sake of something higher. We have to remember, especially where it works, especially where they do read more books or get better grades or do their homework, or write the thank you notes. We have to remember that it's bribery we're engaged in. And we have to find a way to convey to our kids, if, the, if we're talking here about parents and children, that they're being bribed. And so this isn't to identify a line or a place or an age. I don't think we can define it that way. But it's remembering what we in market societies, I think, too easily forget. When the bribes work, when the bribes work, they become incentives. In fact, we've invented a verb to capture this activity, incentivize. That's so familiar now that we forget that this verb is new. It didn't exist before 1980. You couldn't find it in any dictionary. In fact, even the word incentive in the context we're using it here is new. It's not a part of the history of economic thought, though now it's at the center of economics. You don't, it doesn't enter into, Adam Smith never used the term incentive, doesn't enter into economics uh, in the current, until the 20th century, and only becomes common in the last few decades. So what we, we run the risk, and this is what I refer to as the market triumphalist uh, period, where what once may have been bribery becomes incentive. An incentive is a morally neutral term. Bribery isn't. 
bribery reminds us that we are substituting a lower motive for a higher one. And what I want, uh, what I, the way I want to lean against the marketization of things and of self-understandings is to recall us from the language of incentives to the language of bribery and to keep that moral vocabulary alive even if we decide in this or that case uh, we will do best by the child or by the society to traffic for a time in lower things. I, uh, I think maybe we need another, a third term <laughs> uh, because I wouldn't want to go <laughs> as far I wouldn't want so broad a definition of bribery as to capture all the kinds of things I think you had in mind, Melissa. Although I agree with Michael's general sentiment, uh, I don't think, I think it, it would, we would lose the moral force that we need in a term like bribery if we count it as bribery saying, Billy, do your homework to show you love mommy, or you'll love mommy more if you if you really love mommy, you would do your homework. Or, uh, or you, know, you, will, you will be able to be a doctor someday if you do your homework. Now, you're still giving a motive other than, than the intrinsic value of the, of, of the learning. But that's really just a rhetorical, uh, rhetorical issue. The, the general problem is this. We can see at the wholesale level, and, and we go all the way back with Aristotle on this, that you can encourage people towards seeing the intrinsic worth of something by, excuse me, Michael, incentivizing them with things other than the intrinsic value of the thing to, well, what to get was, them. What was the Greek for incentivize? <laughs> <laughs> at the wholesale level, that's clear. Now, now my wholesale retail distinction is going to work. Because at the wholesale level, yeah, yeah, absolutely. The question is retail each time, what will the effect of this policy be? What, what, M Michael didn't result, he, he said that he and his wife look askant. They're worried about what the consequences are of the paid thank you notes. They, he thinks they might not have, but he's not resolving it. I mean, it might be that it's gonna, it's, it's gonna work. The difference between the Sandells and the, I don't know what their names are, but let's say the Smiths, who are doing, engaged in this practice is, the Smiths is a difference of practical judgment. <clears throat> practical judgment. Um, you know, it, 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 it could very well be in this case, I suspect it might be, that, that the Sandells have the wiser view uh, about that, especially with something like gratitude, with thank you notes. Maybe a little different from the homework, uh, I think. But here we're in an area where the practical judgment of the concrete case, the retail case, is what's going to make the difference. And, and it really does take that, that practical wisdom. And, and there's not, there, and, and it's not, Mike was right that it's not line drawing. Uh, it, it's, 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 it's the judgment in the specific case. And part of that is, of course, knowing the particulars of the circumstances and of the child. By circumstances, I mean this. It could be that in, against a, a, a one backdrop of expectations and understandings, and for one culture, or a little subculture, the effect will be X. But against another, the effect is much more likely to be Y. And it might depend on whether it's Billy or Sally. And only really mom and dad or grandma and grandpa can know whether this is going to work for Billy or that's going to work with Sally. You know, it's like parents trying to figure. I had one of my kids could have flourished and gotten straight A's in a classroom with 180 kids in it. We knew that. We made certain decisions about our education based on that. The other one, it was really important that that kid be in a small classroom. Made certain decisions based on that. They were individual to the kid. No state bureaucrat could have decided that. No public policy can be established because you have to know the individual, the individual child. And it's, it's just why it's proper. You as a great scholar of parental rights will understand this, Melissa. It's why it's proper for those kinds of decisions where possible really to be in the family, left to the parents. Well, thank you both very much. Let's offer our thanks to, to, um, thanks, thanks to Michael and Robbie, both for their generosity to be with us here this evening, but also thanking them for modeling for us the good of 
of seeking truth and charity through rational discourse, which is very important here at Notre Dame and, and, and elsewhere. So thank you all very much. Thank you, Carter.